But if someone asks me, can I judge one whiskey against another? I sort of explain it like this. I say, um, you go to the train station, you buy a ticket. The ticket's variable in price. You get on the train, generally you're in first class carriages. And the train's going to take you to exactly the same station. And if you drink enough of it exactly on time, which is more, you can save a British Rail or Virgin train. But the great thing difference is, is what you see out the window. Each whiskey is a different landscape. And you get a different landscape during the process of drinking it and tasting it and savoring it. Particularly with the Isle of Whiskies, they're so smoky, so individual. With the Speyside whiskies, they're much more gentle and sophisticated. The Highland whiskies are a bit like the mountains. They've taken on, a, in fact, whiskies themselves seem to take on the geographical concept and geographical nature, characters of whence they actually come from. The malting of barley is one way in which Scotch differs from bourbon. To learn about this and the many other intricacies of producing fine Scotch whisky, we took a visit to three different distilleries. Welcome to the Glenlivet Distillery. Not just any Glenlivet Distillery, but the Glenlivet Distillery. We'll find out more about that later, but for now let's go and have a look around the place. The first stage in the process of converting barley into malt whisky is the malting process. Now, traditionally the barley was soaked in water for up to two days. It was then spread out over a stone floor where it slowly started to germinate. After five to six days growing on the floor, the germination or growth was stopped by gently drying it using the heat from a fire. And these fires the malting barley were invariably fueled with peat. Now peat in itself has no smell. It's only when you burn it that the very distinctive aroma in the smoke is released. This smoke, and thus the aroma, adheres to the surface of the malted barley as the barley dries, and this imparts a smoky flavour to the whisky. The amount of peat used for drying barley differs from distillery to distillery, from none to others that produce heavily peated whiskies. Well, we crush the crush the barley to get the rest comes up through this pipe. This is where the grist is mixed with water, isn't it? Yeah. In the malting process, and you get a small percentage of sugar being formed, because basically what's happening is, the starch inside the barley seed is being converted into sugar to feed the little embryo plant until such time as it has a stem above the ground and a proper root system and it can fend for itself. So we're trying to restrict the growth but get the maximum breakdown uh, of, of starches inside the seed. The starch that isn't converted to sugar in the maltings will be converted to sugar at, at this stage. So we mix it with hot water, the starches will be instantly converted into sugars, those sugars will dissolve in the hot water. The bottom of this vessel is filled with perforated plates which holds back the solid material and allows the sugar rich liquid to be filtered through. Fermentation is similar for all spirits. The wort is pumped into the fermentation tanks or wash bags and two to three days later after the fermentation process is complete the non-alcoholic wort becomes the alcoholic liquid called wash at about 8% alcohol. From there it's onto the stills. The shape of the stills apparently can make quite a difference. You can see a simple shape all the way down into the body of the still. Another one, instead of being uh, 
convex, what we call trajectory concave, what we call vex, or however, actually a bow. And what that does is influence the activity taking place in the paper as it's being distilled. You have uh, a lot of what we call reflux activity. So vapors are traveling up there. Some of the heavy ones are condensing before they reach the top and falling back down. Uh, and the shape has a big influence on the amount of this reflux activity taking place in the neck of the still. Generally speaking, the still, which is a very tall, narrow neck, will give you a whiskey quite light in body, quite light in flavor. A short one with a wide neck is going to give you a heavier, more full-bodied, more oily character, more viscous character. And the reason is that in a tall, narrow still, you get the various flavors and the alcohols traveling up the neck of the still. In a tall one, before they reach the top, some of those heavy, more viscous components will condense back the liquid and fall back into the still. Only the lighter ones will be carried over to become part of the whiskey flavor. But in a short still, with a wide neck, you'll get a much higher proportion of those heavy flavors being carried over to become part of the whiskey. Now let's find out about the three different cask sizes that the Glenlivet the use for the aging their whiskey. The American bottle, which holds 180, 190 litres. The hogshead, which is the middle size, holds 250 litres. And the largest one is the sherry butt, holds 500 litres. And again, depending on what was in the cask previously, and depending on the size of the cask, that also has an influence on the final flavour that you get because 50% or more of what you finally taste in bottle develops during the maturing process. The casks add flavor, subtract flavor, and interact uh, with it, and you get interaction within the spirit itself. So a huge change takes place, and this is where also the color develops. Bourbon casks are very heavily charred, burnt on the inside. That caramelizes the natural sugars in the wood. Caramelized sugar is brown and that's what gives you uh, the color in the whiskey. And there are some other wood extracts that come out of it as well. And similarly with, with sherry casks, uh, because sherry um, is around about you know, 20 to 25% alcohol, quite a lot of that is absorbed into the wood while the cherry is maturing. When you put strong alcohol in there at you know, 63%, that will take that sherry back out of the wood so you get a little influence from the sherry itself, but also sherry casks will all, always give you a much darker color and a more reddish tinge uh, to the whiskey. In a refinement of the traditional approach, Glen Morangy's had great success with wood-finished malt whiskies. At the end of the normal maturation, the whiskey is transferred for a further period into casks which have previously held another wine or spirit. Glen Morangy port wood finish is the first result of this innovation. Matured in American oak in the normal way, it is then racked for the final maturation in port pipes which have previously contained ruby port from Portugal. They also have a sherry wood finish and Madeira wood finish. When we get to Portugal, Spain and Madeira, we'll be seeing where these pipes and casks they use come from. Hi Sam. <clears throat> Hello Mike. How are you sir? I'm okay, I'm fine. Excellent. Hi. Well, um, we visited the Minister of Rum in the Caribbean, so it's only natural we should visit the Whiskey Laddie in his whiskey castle at Tamantau. <laughs> <Mike? laughs> yeah, that's me. Okay. Uh,
You've got a trackload of different whiskies here. Sure, I have indeed. Um, in coming from all parts of Scotland, and um, obviously they're all going to have their own different characters. Otherwise, you wouldn't need to. Do you know how I describe my whiskies? Come on, let's have a wee look at them. Uh, we have three shelves full of Speyside whisky. We have a further three shelves full of Highland whisky. There's six areas, and then we move along to. A whole island, it can't be much more than 30 miles by 14 miles across, and it's the island of Isla, which produces no less than seven absolutely great whiskies. And if I was to say where the top 20 whiskies come from, all these whiskies would be in that top 20. Wow. All right, then you have your island whiskies, which is Jura, uh, Scapa, Talisker, um, uh, Highland Park, Ladeg, and Arran, which is the latest baby to be reborn on the islands, a new distillery, uh, a re really resurrected one. And then you have the lowland whiskies, um, which are not so many now. There used to be hundreds of lowland whiskies. There's, what, eight or nine now left. So we have the six types of... Oh, areas of production. Aye. Now, obviously, still, with, even from those areas, there's lots of different types, there's different categories and different prices. Um, what, sure. What, how can you categorise the, the different types of whiskey? Well, you've got to be very careful with whiskey because you've got two major whiskies. Uh, well, actually, two major fruits where whiskey come from. One is barley and the other is maize corn. Now, maize corn is easy to crack. The sugars pop out just like that. You can make alcohol. It's done and dusted in a factory process just like that, yeah. which is the majority of what your blended whiskies are. Okay. And some okay. examples of that is... Ah, oh, blended whiskey. Oh, we all know Bells, White and Mackay. Oh, we got oodles of them here. Uh, a very good one. I like you. I really like, you know, Shivers Regal. They're all whiskies which are blended. All right. And they're blended in many different ways with what we call the barley whiskey, which is malt whiskey. Now with barley, you've got to grow it for six or seven days. Yeah. You've got to malt it yeah. to get the sugar out of it. And then you put it in a pot still, not just in a great big factory kettle. All right. And if you've got a, a bottle of um, blended whiskey, you can honestly, uh, in fact, I'll get the teacher's one because the teacher's is very good because on the back it says exactly this. All blended Scotch whiskies are made of two kinds of whiskey, malt and grain, but teacher's Highland cream has an exceptionally high malt content. At least 45% of this bottle of whiskey has come out of a malt pot still from barley. Right. Okay, so we're looking at 55% inexpensively produced, but still barreled for three years or more. Scotch whiskey has to be in an oak barrel kept in Scotland for three years plus. Okay, so you've got excellent, you've got your 55% of what we call corn alcohol from maize, and the rest is made up of blending malt whiskies with this corn alcohol, all right, to make it very smooth, very silky and an, ex uh, and an acceptable tasting. Um, uh, and of course, Teacher's Highland Cream is very sweet. It's yeah. a, a well-known uh, brand name. Yeah. Right. So it's the malt whiskies from all the six areas which can go in to actually making up the taste in a single bottle of blended. Sometimes they put 10, 15, 20 different whiskies in a blended whiskey. All right, you should remember the six areas of whiskies. You've got the Isla, you've got uh, the Ireland whiskies, you've got the Lowland whiskies, you've got Campbelldown whiskies, just a few there, and the Speysides and the Highlands. They all go into producing every single distillery almost. 98% of their production will be for blended whiskies. They're production for the malt whiskies, those wonderful choices that we get, their additions from those distilleries, their barrels they keep back away from the blending, they're the barrels which are probably maybe first fill casks of bourbon or first fill casks or second fill casks of sherry or port and those are the special barrels and they'll keep them maybe for 10, 18 or 20 or 30 and there's some 50 year olds abound but they're very expensive yeah. so we've looked at the the blended whiskey so what uh which is made up of different types of whiskies most um 
important component being, of course, the malted whisky, and then we have the whiskies that are only malted barley. Sure. We need to get it into... in. You've got your blended whiskies, yeah. which are a mixture of corn alcohol, maize alcohol, mixed with the barley malt alcohol. Yeah. All right. Then you have your malt whiskies. Yeah. Now, malt whiskies come into three or four different varieties. Yes. You have your single malt. Yeah. Now, that's not just a single malt from a single barrel. It's not. It's a single malt means coming from a single distillery. Right. And that could be of different ages in the bottle. Right. The bottle may have 16 years on it, but there may be a 20-year-old whiskey in there just right. to bring up the taste. Yeah. All right. Then you have your vatted malts yeah. or pure malts. Uh, some of the labels carry pure on them. It's a bit of a a dodgy grey area, what a pure malt is, but it's a vatted malt, and a vatted malt means that it's a whiskey that will come from several different distilleries and be put in and blended into put into a bottle. But it's still only malted barley. <laughs> still only malted barley. Yeah. You, if you look at the Glenfiddich, it says actually on this bottle here, it says pure single malt. Pure single malt. It's a bit of an anomaly. This is actually a rum casking. It's rather a good one. Okay. Um, and we're not sure what pure single malt means, but we feel that maybe the stills, they've got 27 stills over there. That it's a, a fabulous world product, all right? And then maybe sometimes they kind of keep up with all the demand and they sometimes maybe buy in from the Balvini, which is their sister distillery. Mm. So that would make it a vatted malt. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and then you've got your, your, your single caskings. Right. Shall we have a look at a single casking? Because yeah, you'll be able to spot yeah. that. They normally get a lot more expensive. Here you go, Sam. Here's a good example of a single cask whiskey. This is a signatory vintage. Okay, signatory have taken this and bought this off the distillery from the top of the still and put it in a barrel and warehouse it themselves. Right. In fact, they're the saviors of the Scottish whiskey industry as far as when distilleries go down or no longer exist, right. all right? They've got warehouses of additions from uh, distilleries which are no longer with us. Yeah. Okay, what it is, uh, uh, the joy of a, a bottle like this is, uh, for instance, here. This is bottle number 11 of 178 of them. They got 178 bottles of whiskey off this barrel, which was 27 years old in, in the oak. Remember, you lose a little when it's in the barrel, they're called the angel share. All right, and you get your cast number, which in this particular case was 8566. This makes, and, and of course, it's a cask strength. Right. Uh, it lost quite a lot of its alcohol over the 27 yeah. years. 52.8 uh, is that. Alcohol, uh, when, uh, barrels when they're filled, it can be anything between 65 and 70, sometimes more. Okay, so that's a great way of drinking whiskey. But uh, also, it's almost like drinking a bespoke whiskey, which is bespoke to you, and in this case, to another 177 people only. That makes it really special. They are separate journeys. Same train, same station, same fare, some of them. Each one's a different landscape. And that's the beauty of them. And they are really, truly the, the wines of Scotland, the lifeblood of Scotland, the very essence of what is Scottish. You must never tell anyone that Irish whisky and scotch are the same, especially not an Irishman, or a Scotsman for that matter. You're likely to wind up with two black eyes, one from each. The two are even spelled differently. While we were in Ireland, we took a look at the Irish Big Three. That's Bailey's Irish Cream, Guinness Beer, and of course Irish Whisky. We did get to have a good look at how Irish whisky has been made through the ages, but for now, let's go straight to a tasting session at Jamison's. Welcome to Ireland. We're here at the old Middleton Distillery, which is no longer working. The, the uh, company that owns it now has a new distillery that operates over the back, but it gives us a real good insight into how Irish whisky has been traditionally made. All right. Why 
we have here are four internationally known Irish whiskies. Starting on the left hand corner of the card with John Jemison. Next we have Old Bushmills, Paddy, and the last Irish, John Power. On the top left hand corner of the card is one of the top selling blended Scotch whiskies, Johnny Walker Red Label. And on the top right hand corner of the card is one of the best known bourbon whiskies in the United States, Jim Beam. All of these are blended whiskies, so we're comparing like with like. So what I want you to do for the moment is concentrate on the four Irish. And starting with the Jemison, I want you to smell each of the four Irish, please. Jemison is a very smooth whiskey. It's a sweet whiskey. It's what everybody here is drinking at the moment. And worldwide, it's the best known of all of the Irish whiskies. Very, very smooth. Yeah, see, that's true. Then we move on to Old Bushmills. Mm. And again, if you have a little taste of bush. Old Bushmills is the whisky which is produced up in North Antrim in Northern Ireland. And the water source there runs over basalt rock, giving it a very different taste to the water source down here, which runs underground and over limestone. That's the main difference between us. Now, Paddy was the first Irish whisky to be produced here in Middleton. It's a mild, light whisky. And then the last Irish, John Power. So again, if you have a little taste of power. Now, John Power is a full-bodied, popular Irish whiskey. Now, I want you to smell the scotch, please. Ooh. And now smell the Irish. Ooh. And now I'd like you to taste the scotch. Johnny Walker, really. Okay. Now, do you detect a peaty, smoky flavour from it? I'm not sure if you've tasted it yet. Yes, that's, that's definitely a, yeah. a peaty scotch. And the reason for that is, as I've explained outside, the way they bellow the smoke into the barley at the drying stage when they're drying the malt. Now, I'm not knocking Scotch whisky when I say that. That is the traditional way they have of doing it. Now, if you smell and taste your favourite Irish, right hand, you'll note a complete absence of smoke. It's a smoother, softer whiskey, yeah. I think you'll agree. And of course, the Irish is distilled three times as against the Scotch, which is usually the six twice. Now, bourbon is a sweet whiskey. It's made from maize in Kentucky, in the United States, and it's usually distilled once. And the law in America states that all of their bourbon whiskies have to be casked in new casks. It's the law of the land there. So it gives the whiskey that slightly woody taste. You feel it there at the back of your throat. Also, when you smell it, it's quite perfumed. And the reason for that is that the cereal used is a lot sweeter than what we use, which is barley. And that was Jim Beam. So now, gentlemen, having mm. sampled all of the whiskies, and remembering which country you're in at the moment. Now, I don't wish to influence you in no, any way. No pressure at all. Perhaps you tell me which is your favourite between the Irish, the Scotch, and the bourbon, please, as this gentleman says here, no pressure. The Irish make some great whisky. They also produce some of the world's very best guitars. I could hardly pass up the opportunity to have a bit of a jam in one of Dublin's guitar shops. 